Hi and welcome back. So you may have already seen the video on irony and Oedipus the King and you'll know that that focuses quite a lot on blindness. Now irony and Euripides back eye takes on a different tone and that's what we're going to have a look at in today's video. So we're going to focus on the passage quite early on in the play where actually Pentheus meets Dionysus for the first time. So here in the irony lies in the fact that Pentheus has no idea to whom he's speaking. He is defaming Dionysus to Dionysus himself. And um, this is the case because um, Pentheus' servants have captured Dionysus. That is something that Pentheus promised to do after the Argon that we saw in the last video. So he said he was going to capture the person who brought the Bacchic ritual to Thebes. And here the servants appear. Um, with Dionysus himself, he is in the form of a human. Straight away from the servant's description, if you're reading along with me, we're at say line 435, um, the servants mention features about Dionysus in disguise that are really ominous and that Pentheus should really pick up on, but doesn't, as usual he's oblivious. So, the fact that Dionysus was captured willingly the servant says, his patient made my job so easy, I felt bad. And I said, stranger, I didn't want to catch you. I'm obeying Pentheus' orders. And the Minats, whom you caught and chained up in the public jail, are gone. They skipped off freely to the hills, calling on their god, the Lord of Thunder. Um, the chains around their ankles just dissolved. The bolts released the doors without the touch of human hand. This man's a miracle worker. Well it's for you to tell what's best to do. So all these really mysterious things have happened and Pentheus doesn't really compute any of them. He knows that this person has some sort of supernatural power but he ignores it, perhaps because he doesn't trust his servant. He just simply says, untie his hands. He's trapped inside my net. He can't run from me now. He's not so quick. So just for a bit of perspective, a net is such as a hunting net. Um, and Pentheus starts to size up Dionysus in disguise and here we get clues again, think about performance, as to what kind of mask might be used to depict Dionysus and to single him out as a god in disguise. Well stranger, I can see you are attractive to women anyway. That's why you came here. Your hair is long, unsuitable for wrestling. It ripples down your cheeks so alluringly. Your skin is white. You must take care of it, avoiding sunlight, staying in the shade. Hunting Aphrodite with your beauty. Tell me first, what family do you come from? <clears throat> now, the hair and the skin tone are pitched as being quite effeminate. Long hair is not always necessarily effeminate in the ancient world. There are bronze busts and, and statues of Spartan men having really long hair, for example. But here, unsuitable for wrestling and the fact that it's kind of curvy around his cheek is presented as being very feminine. The fact that Dionysus is very pale as well. So you might have seen the Bronimus vase shows noble people and particularly noble women, noble virgins to be very, very pale. Even on that red figure vase, you can see that they're picked out in white when tragic masks of them are made. And a similar thing seems to have been done for Dionysus here. Um, and Dionysus reveals that he is from Lydia um, and he claims to have been sent by Dionysus. So this can all be read and understood as Dionysus talking about himself in third person. And what we start to notice from there is the rapid fire between Pentheus and Dionysus. So the intensity is totally different from the argument we saw before where Cadmus, Tiresias and Pentheus each give each other lots of air time. So, is there a new Zeus out there who breeds new gods? No, the same Zeus who married Semele here. Was it in dreams he pushed you to this quest? No, it was my waking eyes he taught the rites. These rites of yours, what are they like exactly? The uninitiated must not know. So stick a myth here, remember it's like a verbal game of tennis and it picks up the speed and the pace. And again, we get to the crux of Pentheus's insecurities. Um, are your rights done at night or in the day? Most at night, darkness is magical. Dirty tricks, says Pentheus, just to seduce our women. So Pentheus' concern about the back eye is that these women are off, um, as I said before, committing acts of much hair, premarital or extramarital sex. Um, 
And Dionysus reassures Pentheus that although he is a Dionysus himself, he's near and knows my situation. So Dionysus acts like a bit of a mole, a bit of an insurgent to get close to Pentheus. And Euripides is able to exploit this irony to make the audience quite uncomfortable. We know when Pentheus acts out the way he does, how dangerous it is because he's got Dionysus in a net, you know, he feels that he has Dionysus trapped, but the audience, Euripides' audience, know that Dionysus has Pentheus trapped. The servant has made clear to them that Dionysus at any moment could make that net disappear. He's made the shackles on, the sl on his minads disappear, he's made the bolts of the jail unlock. So Pentheus is kind of hubris in his arrogance, thinking that he's got Dionysus trapped, he's completely unfounded, and Euripides has given those clues to the audience. Um, and Dionysus says to Pentheus, impiety has made you blind, do you know who Dionysus is with me? Um, and when Pentheus suggests that Dionysus should be bound, do not bind me, I am saying you are not. You do not know yourself or what you're doing, okay? So again, we have irony upon irony because the audience is privy to information that Pentheus is not privy to. Um, and again, he asks for Dionysus to be shut away in the stables, um, to which Dionysus goes willingly. So we've had an encounter between um, Pentheus and Dionysus, and what follows is a choral intervention where we can see Dionysus interact with the chorus because he escapes, as we might expect, um, being imprisoned. So here we have Dionysus and the chorus really reassert his power after this really deeply ironic scene that we've just seen. Um, and what follows then is Pentheus meeting Dionysus outside of the prison and realising that he's escaped. And that brings us on to a disguise scene that we'll talk about in more detail next time. So things to think about for now when you're thinking about irony and back eye are how does that level of dramatic irony affect the way we view Pentheus's character? We saw in the Argon that he's quite indignant and quite strident um, and for the audience knowing who Dionysus is makes Pentheus's errors even more poignant and even more obvious. What do they tell us about the reach of Dionysus's power? He's set the prologue, he's set the tone for the tragedy, but he's also very insidious. He's managing to snake his way into the action and undermine the power of the king. He releases prisoners and escapes himself. Um, and how does this shape the theme of the hunter and the hunted? That's something that's going to come up time and again. And remember, we had the hunting setting of the Acteon story that Cadmus mentioned in the previous video, where he said, you know, don't be ripped apart by your own, like Acteon, stay out of danger. Um, and again, we see the hunting motif here when Pentheus feels that he has Dionysus instead. So they're just a few things that you can apply to the scene and use to think about the tragedy in more detail when you're reading the rest. Okay, I hope you stay safe and well. Don't forget to like, subscribe and share the videos as well to keep the channel going. Alright, see you next time.